afternoon. I'm Jennifer Boll. I'm the chair of the Women's Initiative here at Bond. Thank you for joining us for our program. I just wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the Women's Initiative, which is uh, supporting this program. Uh, we began in 2008, and our mission is to support and promote the professional development of women attorneys here at Bond. Um, we also support and promote programs for uh, women professionals throughout our communities. And with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Bond's uh, Professional Development and Diversity Officer, Kim Wolf-Price, to tell you about our program today. Thanks, Jen, and thanks for your leadership on the Women's Initiative. So the Torchbearer Spotlight came about from discussions, camaraderie, and work of the Women's Initiative Committee. The group recognized the significant contributions of the women at Bond, and that as history brings us more and more firsts for women of all backgrounds and identities, it was time to shine a light on the women attorneys here. The spotlight focuses on women attorneys formerly or currently at Bond in all stages of their careers. The Torchbearer Spotlight showcases the many ways Bond women lead and inspire others in their law practice, private life, community and civic engagements, and educational experiences. These spotlights are a dialogue between colleagues with the interviews being conducted by fellow attorneys, and you are invited into this conversation. Bond women light the way, and we want to applaud and honor those efforts so you can get to know them, and they can inspire you as they inspire us. So I'm thrilled that Monica Barrett is our first spotlight, and I will turn this now over to two other amazing attorneys here at Bond, Shannick and King, Sarah Richmond and Ayanna Thomas. Sarah? Hi, Kim. Thank you very much for that introduction, and Thanks, Jen, for all your work with the Women's Initiative. It's really been transformative uh, at Bond for me and my experience at Bond. And Monica, looking forward to talking with you a little. Um, 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 Monica and I worked together in the New York office, for those of you who don't know, but most, I think, do. Um, and um, I'm going to lead it off, I guess, just to sort of talk a little bit about, about, about Monica and find out a little bit about her background information and you know, what, what, what initially, initially influenced you in your life through your family, your parents, was it a traditional background? You know, how'd you grow up? Thanks a lot, Sarah. And, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. And I I'm honored uh, that I I'm part of this torchbearer series. And I, I, I grew up, I, I mean, traditional, I grew up in a traditional family in the sense of, um, but my uh, parents were um, took us to church on Sundays, and my parents had seven children. So back then, it was we were in the within the baby boom post World War II. Um, so having seven children was the norm back then, and um, a, a real strong influence, uh, of course, were, were my parents, and especially I, I'd have to say my mother. Uh, she was. Um, she worked outside the home, as did my father. And um, before she was married, she was a public school math teacher. Uh, then she was married and have, had seven children and then went back to work when we moved to um, Jamesville, New York, which is right outside of Syracuse. And um, in 1968, uh, she got a job uh, teaching in the middle school, eighth grade math. And she was there for 10 years. Um, and in 1978, the school district asked her to move to the high school. And I think both Sarah and Ayana will appreciate this um, school district story because they do a lot of work for school districts. So my mother um, in 1978, the summer, I remember I was about to go to college and she was on the beach studying geometry because she was gonna to have to teach geometry in the fall. And in eighth grade, she hadn't had to teach geometry. So she spent most of the summer studying up on geometry and also trigonometry. And she started teaching in the high school. So from 1978 until 1982, happily teaching in the high school, got used to it. And then the school district, my mother was in her early sixties by that time. And um, the school district, the principal said to her, we'd like you to go back to the middle school because there's more of a demand for math teacher back there. And so my mother, I remember her telling me this story. She decided um, she was not gonna 
put up with this just automatically going back to the middle school. So she was very, because she was very happy by the time she had been four years at the high school. She went into the assistant superintendent who actually was, uh, lived in our neighborhood. And she said to him, I think I'm being asked to go back to the middle school because I am an older woman. And with that, they backed off and they let her stay in the high school and for another three years until she retired. I mean, when she said, I'm an older woman, she also said, there are men who are younger than I am, who have less seniority and you haven't asked them. And so, uh, you know, she didn't go outside and get a lawyer. She didn't um, hire Bon Shenick and King. She just went <laughs> into the assistant superintendent and, and said, I, this is not right. And, and she was correct. And they reversed course and let her stay. So, you know, major influence on my life, um, my, both my parents, but my mother in standing up for herself. So that, that was, uh, you know, I remember that. Uh, vividly. Well, I love it that she shared that story with you, because I think as a young woman growing up, especially in that time, because it was unusual for a woman to stand up for herself the way that your mother did, that I'm sure that influenced you as you moved forward in your career um, and in decisions you had to make and how you had to address choices and difficult situations. So from there, when you were, um, I guess, in uh, in, after high school, what made what, what did you do next? Did you all know you went to college, I assume? Um, where did you go to college? And how did you choose so I, where you went? Yeah, so I, I went to, to Wellesley College, and um, it's an all-women's college, and um, I, it had a beautiful campus. One of my older sisters was a student at Boston College, and I remember when we visited her at Boston College, uh, we went out to Wellesley, and I just loved the campus. Um, it was a very good school. I, I can tell you that I, I was not that happy as an undergrad because it was pretty intense academically. Um, but I, I, since then, I'm, I'm very happy that I went there. And I, I remember at one time, probably around the same time my mother was uh, going to the assistant superintendent and complaining about um, the, the pending move. I, I wanted to take a year off of, of college. I, I guess this was a little bit earlier. It was about 1980 and I was a sophomore. And I said, you know, I wanted to travel. And my, I remember my mother saying to me, she was, she was very good and said, well, you can certainly do that, Monica, but you have to remember your father and I are gonna retire. So basically, she, you know, I quickly, <laughs> I quickly realized that, um, you know, my parents were paying the tuition, and I, uh, I was not going to take a year off because that was a little subtle hint that I could do what I want, but you know, the the, um, they they were not going to support me if I didn't stay in college. So that was, you know, I was I, there a reason that you chose a women's college particularly? Um, well, I. I yeah, I, I was encouraged um, by my parents um, to I, actually it, it, this sort of gets at your first question, whether we had a traditional family Our, our my parents had decided we could they wanted us to go to Catholic colleges or um, for the daughters. I have, I have five sisters, so we could go to a Catholic college or a women's college. So it, I decided uh, Wellesley was a good place for me. Okay, that makes sense. So, so how, what degree did you did you ultimately graduate with? What did you study I, there? I studied philosophy. I, I started out. I, I have to admit, as uh, pre med, um, and I barely passed first semester chemistry. So I decided, <laughs> um, you know, getting a C minus my first semester. Um, made me change course and take uh, take philosophy. So it, it was a good major for especially- It's for funny, I, I majored in philosophy as well. So I think that's, it's a good background for law, I think. Um, were you thinking law at the time? No, I, I actually was sort of, um, I mean, when I was in college, a lot of, of my um, peers were applying to law school right away. And I was kind of resistant to it. And I guess I had that wanderlust in me from when I was a sophomore and my mother convinced me now's not the time to travel. Uh, right. uh, so I, I just, I felt like uh, there was a lot of pressure to 
um, to interview with jobs with investment banking or with law school, you know, apply to law school. And I just um, felt like I now was the time to do, you know, do some traveling, which I ultimately did. Yeah. So where'd you go? What'd you do? Well, so I, I went, um, I traveled to uh, California with four friends and um, I, I admit, I already said that my parents were basic, they, they covered, um, they paid for my tuition for undergrad. So I was in a privileged position where I did not have student debt at when I graduated from college. And so I could afford to join another group of friends. We all traveled across the country. It took us like five weeks to go across. We camped at um, odd locations that weren't official campsites that today, if I, if I thought my kid was gonna camp in a place like that, I would, I would <laughs> have a heart attack. So it was, it was more in the sense of, you know, we're free. It was the late 70s or early 80s. And um, we all got jobs in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I worked as a server in a restaurant, three different restaurants uh, for about a year before I, I returned to the East Coast. Um, so how long, so you did, when you returned to the East Coast, is that when you decided to go to law school or how did that come about, the decision to be a lawyer ultimately? So I, I um, when I returned to the East Coast, I got a job in uh, a publishing company in Manhattan. It was Alfred Knopf Publishers, and I was an editorial assistant. And um, I part of my job was to read unsolicited manuscripts, um, and there were a lot of them that were unsolicited. And um, I, I, I mean, it was a good job. I met fascinating authors, although I wasn't on the front line working with these authors. I met people like Robert Caro. I met um, Raymond Carver and Toni Morrison. They were all authors at Alfred Knopf. And, you know, there were periods of time I was the receptionist, so I would greet them when they came in. So it was you know, it was pretty incredible uh, meeting them, but I, I also realized I didn't have any talent for recognizing the next great American novel. <laughs> so I just decided um, by that time, um, one of my older sisters was a lawyer and um, she was a big influence on me in um, applying to law school. So that, that was 19, spring of 1985, I was deciding to apply to law school. And you ended up at uh, University of Michigan Law School, right? Is that, I yes. think I remember that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. how'd you get there? How'd you end up there? So, so in, in 1985, I, I was living in Brooklyn and again with, with a couple of friends and I was, um, I had, I was coming out as a lesbian in 1985 and I was realizing it. And I also felt like I wanted to go to a law school that was supportive of LGBTQ students. And um, back then, um, when you applied to law school and you were accepted, you got a big packet um, in the mail, the regular mail, that was actually a catalog. And, and I spent a lot of time looking at the catalogs and I was choosing between Georgetown, NYU, and University of Michigan. And Believe it or not, back in 1985, the only law school catalog that made any reference to lesbian and gay law students association was the University of Michigan. And they actually had a page dedicated. And, and back then it was not LGBTQ, it was lesbian and gay. And um, the, the page, it was a full page describing the Lesbian and Gay Law Students Association, and it had a contact name on the bottom and her phone number, and her name was Cindy Poe. And I called her up and I talked to her about what it was like at Michigan to be a lesbian. And she was very um, supportive of the community there. She said it, it was a great community. Ann Arbor was a wonderful town, which it is. And she said the University of Michigan um, was very progressive and it was a great law school for LG students. 
And so NYU didn't even have anything about LG, lesbian and gay students back then. And that's, that's what was so surprising when I think back on it. So anyway, I, you know, I think about it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, you I, mean, know, I think about it as well, because you and I are, are peers and you know, I'm a little behind you, but um, I don't recall hearing anything about um, lesbian and gay groups or affinity groups or classes on it or anything when I was applying a law to this either. Um, yeah, and, and this was, here. yeah, and, and, and this was, you know, of course, um, right at, in the midst of the AIDS crisis. So, right. um, you know, there was a lot of discrimination in, in, um, in professional offices um, against lesbians and gays back then. So um, when I got to Michigan, of course, one of the all the student groups had events and a welcoming events. And so I went to the lesbian and gay um, welcoming event. And the only other person who was a member of the group was Cindy Poe. And so it, it was, uh, you know, so I immediately uh, was elected the vice president of the lesbian and gay law students at Michigan. But it was the two of us at that meeting. But then two weeks later, we had another meeting and we had it later in the evening after um, the academic classes were over. We had it in the law school building and 12 people attended. So it was a time where most people were closeted. Now, uh, that was 1985, fall of 1985. I remember in the fall of 1987, greeting new students um, at Michigan Law School at the first meeting of the Lesbian and Gay Law Students Association. And, and, and that by that time, in that two year period, it was now the LGBTQ. Um, and I was talking about uh, Michigan being progressive. There were 40 people at that meeting. So oh. it was the times had changed drastically in that two year period. And many of the people who were who were at the meeting were first year law students. So there must have been uh, 15 first year law students. They had been active in ACT UP, which is the organization that was protesting at in front of NIH, protesting before Anthony Fauci about the lack of research uh, money for AIDS research. So it, it was an incredible time and it really transitioned quite a bit in that um, two year period in law school. So did you notice a difference then when you were graduating law school and thinking about what sort of career you wanted to have or what sort of path between how you were going to be accepted or how, your, um, how being a woman and a lesbian would be uh, received in a legal job as opposed to how it was when you had graduated from college for you know three years earlier or four or actually more than that um was there a difference that you noticed some sort of yeah I, I i mean i well i you know i have to admit now that i was not out professionally so i it was safe in law school but when i was going out on the job market i was not out and and in fact um i didn't um I didn't actually explicitly come out in, in my professional life until I, until I started working at Rutgers, which was um, eight years after I graduated from law school. So, you know, that's, that's part of, you know, the, my, you know, the way I grew up in a more, um, more uh, closeted time, I think, compared to the other, the later uh, law students at Michigan. I did find that um, when I interviewed at law firms, um, I would ask how many women partners were at the firm. And um, I remember one, one interviewee, interviewer didn't know offhand and he had to look at the letterhead and actually uh, realize there was only one. So it was, <laughs> you know, a situation where it, um, you know, I felt like back then maybe going to a law firm uh, was going to be more difficult than other types of jobs. So after you graduated law school, what sort of path did you take? Um, you know, we know to get to bond, I'll tie yes. up with that. <laughs> yes. So I, I, um, 
I first clerked for a judge in New Jersey. She was uh, Judge Sylvia Pressler, and and she was a very, um, very good mentor to me. She was the presiding judge on the appellate division um, in the New Jersey Superior Court, and she was um, very outspoken, and she was a great writer. I can, I mean, whenever I read New, at the time when I was practicing in New Jersey, whenever I read an appellate division um, case, I could always recognize her writing because it, it was so good, and she she always had a lot of detail about the facts in the cases. And I, I, I wrote opinions for her and she was very supportive um, with me in my career. And I did have, unlike when I graduated from college, I did have law school debt, although it wasn't, um, it wasn't ha as high as law students who graduate these days have. It, it was relatively uh, modest debt. So I was concerned and about paying it back. And I, I did take a job at a law firm right after I clerked for Judge Pressler. And it was a big law firm in New Jersey. And I was in the litigation department. And um, I, I was treated very well. But I remember the, the work itself. I was working for one partner who actually had a bench trial in her case. So in the, I was only there for a year. In the year I was there, I, I worked with her on this trial and the, the subject matter of the trial was um, a lawsuit over reverse engineering of window extrusions. So window extrusions are the plastic things that you pop into a window to make it look like you have a frame. And it was just so dull that I, um, <laughs> I was not happy at the law firm. And so a friend of mine, um, a very good friend of mine who I went to law school with, um, saw an ad in the National Law Journal for a job as assistant general counsel at Cornell University. And she encouraged me to apply. And when I got the job at Cornell, I thought to myself, oh boy, I didn't think I would get it. And now I have to make a decision. And I was under a lot of family pressure not to take it because um, my sister who was a lawyer in New Jersey and my, my parents were convinced I was gonna ruin my career if I gave up um, the job at the law firm and went to Cornell. Um, I, I took the job, it turned out very well uh, I had a great experience um, working at Cornell, and I had it had never occurred to me that there was a field of higher education law, and mm -hmm. and so it was um, it was a really good move, and I sort of stood up to my parents the way my mother had stood up to her assistant superintendent, and um, and it turned out very well for my career. And I believe you had mentioned. Um when you and I and Ayana were speaking earlier about this, that it was there at Cornell that you met one, other than Cindy Poe, one of your first major torchbearers for you, uh, Tom Santoro. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Um, do you want to, I, I'm going to actually turn every, turn it over to Ayana at this point, um, you know, to ask Ayana, and Ayana can tell you a little bit about her, tell everybody a little bit about herself, but if you could tell us about Tom Santoro and, and what it meant to you to have him as a torchbearer. Sure. Um, would be great. And, and, you know, mind you, I was, uh, let's see, I was three, three years out of law, or I was going into my third year out of law school when I took the job at, at um, Cornell. And um, at the time, Cornell did most of its, handled most of its litigation in-house. And Tom Santoro was the um, was the lead litigator, and uh, Patricia McClary was also a litigator there. And I was hired to be the assistant general counsel and litigator. And the cases involved employment discrimination cases, and also personal injury cases, um, and uh, veterinary cases because Cornell has a big vet school. And Tom Santoro uh, 
let me do, um, let me handle motion practice, go into uh, courts throughout um, upstate New York and argue motions. I, I was taking depositions, I was de defending depositions, and I was handling arbitration. So it was, um, it was really a, a, an incredibly good experience working there. And I, um, I, I remember him, um, I, I'm still in touch with Tom, he's now retired in Florida, but I, um, to, the, to this day, I guess with the Me Too um, movement and also the allegations against Governor Cuomo, I remember one time um, Tom and I and other colleagues from Cornell were at a conference in California and we had to make a phone call to our clients back in Ithaca. And it was an early morning phone call. We had to make the call at 8 a.m. Eastern time, which meant 5 a.m. California time. And we were at this conference in a hotel. And so we, we planned, I mean, this was pre um, cell phones being all over the place. So um, if you had to make a phone call, you had to make it in your hotel room for the privacy. So Tom said, what, come to my room at 5 a.m. and we'll make the call. Or she, he said a couple of minutes before five. And I, I remember, you know, like being nervous. This is weird going to a hotel room. And he was fully dressed in a suit and tie and jacket. And, and um, he had made the bed, you know, like as if the, ma the house uh, cleaner had come in. And so it, there was no tension at all. It wasn't like he sh he answered the door in his in his workout clothes, and I just thought that took a lot of thought about you know how not to make it an uncomfortable scene you know to to do a business call in a hotel room. So you know I I think now of how many things happen at on, at conferences and uh, bad things. And I just give him a lot of credit for just thinking way ahead and just making it, you know, no tension involved. Hi everyone, my name's Ayana Thomas. I'm also, I'm an associate in New York City office and I had the pleasure of working with Sarah Monica. Actually our office are not too far from each other. We're always like popping in and uh, they're always dropping in um, hallway. I call it hallway gems. Like, in passing, um, they always give me words of wisdom, words of advice. So I'm grateful to have them both um, as colleagues in the New York City office. Uh, Monica, um, you mentioned your experience working at Cornell. Can you tell us more about your experience at Rutgers? Sure, yeah, and, and uh, Ayana, it's, um, I know we, we've all been just seeing each other on Zoom, but I, I, I know it's, uh, you know, it's a pleasure working with both you and Sarah, and I, I so much appreciate your view of different perspective on all the cases we work on together. And when I went to Rutgers, um, I, I had um, applied to Rutgers and it was in the midst of, um, I, I had my first interview and then I was gonna speak, I was scheduled to speak at a uh, conference on sexual harassment. And I knew um, the general counsel at Rutgers was gonna be at that conference. so. I told him when I interviewed with him the first time that I was going to speak at the conference, and um, and so he he was in the audience, and I gave my talk, and he um, after the talk he left a message on my hotel room answering machine, telling me he heard it and he thought it was great, and it and it just it just made me realize how important those personal touches are. Um, to, you know, to, to, he made me realize I was, you know, a strong candidate for the job. I still had more interviews to go through, but he knew how to reach out and just give me positive feedback and encourage me. So, you know, the whole time I worked at Rutgers, he was the type of mentor, colleague who would, um, I would go into his office with a problem and he would say, okay, let's call the client right now. And he'd pick up the phone. And it was, it taught me a lot about not letting myself get frozen up and panicky about legal situations. And I just, I, I always think of that when, like when I talk to other 
people in our office, you know, when we talk to each other about legal issues with um, that we're dealing with for clients. And, you know, I know that there have been times where I think I'm, um, I don't know what to do and I have to talk to the client soon. And when I talk to somebody else like you, Ayana or Sarah, I, I'm able to feel more at ease. And, you know, like one of you might encourage me the way David Scott did, like just call the client and talk and talk to them about it. So it, it's, I, I just appreciate that experience with David and he, and he was, he's been, he's been totally supportive of me through my career and I'm, I'm still in touch with him as well. That's one thing um, you've mentioned throughout um, this presentation, Monica, how you're staying in touch with your torchbearers. Like you mentioned David Scott, you're still in touch with him. You mentioned you're still in, in touch with um, Tom San, Santero as well. Um, as a young associate, sometimes uh, when you transition from law school to a law firm and you forget about the torch period that paved the way to get to where you are um, now. So that's, I think you can make that note that it's important to always keep in touch with those who have paved the way for, for you. That's right. And, and I think, Ayana, I know you, you go to the St. John's alumni um, galas every year, and I think the St. John's Law School, and I think that, um, you know, you remember people from law school and college, professors, and I think it helps just to drop somebody a handwritten note. Um, and, and I remember one professor, philosophy professor I had at Wellesley, I had read that he um, he took a job at Yale and I and he had a book published. And this was like 25 years after I had him in college. And I just wrote him a note and just put the address uh, as Yale on it. And, you know, I didn't hear back from him because it wasn't an email like it, it, there wasn't you know, you don't really say thank you for you know, there's not a need to communicate back to a handwritten note. But anyway, I, five years later, he wrote to me, he sent me an email and he said, you know, I remember getting this note. I meant to respond, but I've kept the note and it, it was just so meaningful to me. So I, I just, you know, I, it's never too late is my point to, to just go back and, you know, drop somebody a note from your past. I think it helps. Yes. And also, um, Monica, I but as when I was in law school, they always say first go to, you know, of course, finish law school, go to a, a, a large law firm, and then try to get into in house because no one likes billing hours. And of course, <laughs> um, from, <laughs> from this presentation, you, you took a different route, an additional route, where you went from law firm, you realized you didn't like it, then you transitioned to in house, now back to a law firm. How was that transition back to Bond? Back to, I'm sorry, to Bond. So it's, you know, Bond, I mean, because I grew up in Syracuse, I felt like, uh, all right, I don't want, all right, I was going to use the phrase coming home. That's not what it was, but it's, uh, you know, it's it's like, it's just, the people at Bond are, are so familiar to me um, in terms of, um, you know, there's, I mean, we're in the New York City office, but we, a lot of our colleagues um, are in Syracuse and Albany, upstate offices, and in in Kansas City and Florida, but it but it's it's it was easy for me because of the torchbearers who are at Bond, like Shelley Kale and Marion Katsieve, who are um, now approaching retirement. But they have they were so supportive of me when I came to Bond, and then you know we have a relatively small office in New York City, and we have lunch together in non-pandemic times. And it's it's a good break, you know, where we we don't talk about work. We just, you know, get together for 45 minutes and tell stories about our families. Um, I talk a lot about my wife, Alexis, and my stepsons. And it's just, it's a strong um, comfort level, you know, the break from the tension of the law practice. And, um, you know, there, there are, I, I mean, I love interacting with lawyers who are just a year out of law school, two years out of law school. And Ayana, I know you went to law school, undergraduate school with my niece. And so, 
it's, you know, I, I love that perspective from a different age group and it makes me think um, in different ways about the law. So I, I, I really think it's a wonderful place to be. And I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it sounds like I'm making this up, but I'm not. I, I do feel like I made the right move and I feel, I feel great having left in-house to come to Bond. That's great. And how do you see yourself as a torchbearer at Bond? How are you, you know, you've been here by now, um, six years, aren't you? Yeah, the, yeah, about almost six years. Um, you know, I, th I think I, I've had um, experiences in my career where, um, you know, in, in where I was in-house and I actually had to say to a client, um, you know, a top level person, you cannot say this because it's not true. And so I've had you know, were times where I've had to be very firm and because I had to stand up for, um, you know, the obviously I can't support someone who is, um, who may not tell the truth on a witness stand, but to, to be firm about my own integrity. And, and um, I think I, I'm able to convey that kind of advice um, to, colleagues at the firm. Um, I've had a variety of experience that I'm willing to share. I, I think it's important that I share my, the mistakes I've made in the past, you know, maybe where I, I could have done something differently in a particular case. And I'll talk to um, a lawyer who's, who's uh, less experienced than I am and admit that, you know, this is what happened. This is how I got out of it. And um, this is what I learned uh, going forward. So I think the more I can uh, talk to people about my own career, I think it's helpful. I also, as I mentioned, I like talking about my family. I mean, I, I think that maybe that's a reaction to being, you know, the beginning part of my career, um, being closeted about who I was with and not talking about people I, from my family at work. So, you know, I, I mentioned my wife a lot and somebody, somebody um, told me that um, she thought it was great that I mentioned Alexis, um, you know, in conversation. And I think it, that, believe it or not, was hard to start doing for me in the workplace because of when I went to law school back in the 80s. I'm sure. Um, so generally, what kind of advice would you give young associates about finding torchbearers, using people to, to support them, um, what they should be doing. Yeah. So, you know, I, I like, I, 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 when I think of the term torchbearer, I think of, um, you know, someone who shows you the light, shows you a different light. And it doesn't have to be a mentor. It could be a, a, a peer. And, you know, I, I think when, I applied for the job at Cornell. I didn't do it because I found the ad and decided to apply. It was a friend of mine who said, you should really apply for this job because you don't seem that happy where you are. And so, you know, it, there was my peer being a torchbearer. So I think young associates can be torchbearers for each other. And I, I think, you know, when I talk about um, Ayana, when you and I work on cases together, you're a torchbearer for me because you're you're letting me see a different perspective. And you know, I my my wife Alexis is black, and when we talk to each other about what's going on in society, she's a torchbearer for me because I learn a lot um, that I didn't learn growing up white in this society. So it's like everybody can be a torchbearer for others, I think. And Monica, we also That's had, very... sorry, Sarah. Monica, we also had no, some conversations about um, advocating for yourself as associates. Sometimes we think that advocacy should be limited to partners, um, that associates should be just keep your mouth quiet and just listen to what others are telling you and not to advocate for yourself. 
Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I remember having conversations with associates and giving that advice and then um, having the associates come back to me and, and say, you told me to advocate for myself and this is what I'd like. And, and so I realized it, it, it was kind of, it, it made me recall, um, I, Ayana, you, you might appreciate this, my niece, Amelia, who you went to, to uh, New, SUNY New Paltz with. I, my niece Amelia is 30 years old now. And when I met um, Alexis, um, her, Alexis's two sons, my stepsons were about Amelia's age. And, um, and um, I used to go on vacations with Amelia and her mother, Mary, my sister, Mary, a lot. And then when I introduced um, Max and Sam to the vacations, Amelia sat me down at one point and said to me, um, it was just the two of us and she was only 12 at the time. And she said, I'm not quite used to you being around other children who are my age and you paying attention to them. And I remember thinking, oh boy, I wish she wasn't so smart to like use this <laughs> the way she talked to me. And I, you know, Ayana, when I think of associates who are listening to my advice and then they use my advice to talk to me about what they want. I, 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 it reminded me of like, oh, okay. <laughs> they're listening to my advice and you know, I, I have to respond and they're doing a good job with it. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, you know, we're sort of coming to the, the, the end of the, the time that we have together. Um, and, and um, you know, I, through this whole process because you and I and Ayana have been talking for weeks about sort of what this means and what being a torchbearer means, that I guess that we want to sort of end this by talking about the different levels of torchbearers and why it's important um, both to be a torchbearer and to have torchbearers in your life, um, in your, both your professional life and your personal life as well. I mean, I think you've touched on both aspects. I mean, is there something sort of in closing, some, some idea you'd like to give or, you know, about what, what we can all do going forward to make sure that we are and have torchbearers in our lives. Well, I, I, you know, I find it's, um, it's good to be open with people and to be, um, you know, to be willing to step in and, and give advice, even though it might not be asked for. So, you know, sometimes you might get shut down, but in times where I have, um, I have appreciated it, um, you know, colleagues have come into my office and said, you know, you seem, you, you know, is there anything I can do to help you or what's going on? You know, so it's, I mean, that's what I missed during the pandemic. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. we're not around each other, but you know, I look forward to to coming back and and just being able to to be open with each other and uh, there for each other. I I think you know that's I, I think it'll be such a pleasure to to actually be able to to have those hallway conversations, Ayana, that you you mentioned. Hallway gems. <laughs> yes, hallway gems. Yes. Well, Monica, I want to thank you for, for this, for this whole, for doing this. For me and, and I think for Ayana as we were doing this, you know, made us or made me think about who were the torchbearers in my life and also what I could do more to be a torchbearer for others. And also to recognize that every choice I make, others see and are thinking about and can be an inspiration to somebody else or can be a guiding point or a touch point for someone else and that it's important um, for all of us to have people in our lives over time that serve these roles um, and to serve them as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ayana to, to bring us home. So thank you. Thank you very much, for, Monica. It was great hearing about everything. Thanks, Sarah. Everybody. Again, thank you, Monica, for being our torchbearer. And one takeaway um, that's really struck with me throughout this presentation is that we are all torchbearers. We all have a duty to, to pay it forward. And when one woman wins, we, we all win. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in to our, our first inaugural Torchbearer series. 
with Monica Barrett. And please feel free to tune into our next series on June 9th for our next Torchbearer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.